Do you guess blog? Do you write articles for other sites? Is it worth the effort? Does Google and other search engines hate it? That's what we're going to discuss in today's episode of the Blog Centric Podcast. Welcome to Spider Working's Blog Centric Podcast, a podcast about blogging. Hello and welcome to episode 51 of the Blog Centric Podcast. I'm Amanda Webb and if you want to read more about today's topic or access any of the resources that I talk about, you can find that in the show notes, which is at spiderworking.com forward slash 51. Guest posting has a bad name. Back in 2014, the head of Google's spam team, Matt Cutts, told us to stop doing it. That guest blogging for search engine optimization is dead. But in 2016, it is still an effective way of building your brand or your business online. If you do it well, you could still benefit from the inbound links too. You're listening to Blog Centric from Spiderworking. Inbound links are at the heart of search engine optimization. Each quality and relevant link that you get back from another website, when somebody links to you, that's good for your search engine rankings. That improves your domain authority and there's a better chance of you appearing in search results. Guest blogging has a bad name and that's because of marketers. It wasn't so long ago that it was a legitimate link building strategy to post articles on what we called content farms in order to get an inbound link. When I started blogging, that was acceptable practice. I didn't do it, but I know people who did and apparently it worked. But guest blogging got out of hand. And you know the weird thing? I still get at least two email requests a week from people offering quality articles for my site. And most of these requests seem to be automated. And I don't think I've read any that convince me they've actually read an article on my site. For that reason, it's rare that I would ever accept a blog post. In fact, probably never just because they sent me an email. But today I'm not talking about accepting blog posts. I'm talking about writing guest blog posts for other people. I just wanted to tell you about those dodgy emails so that you'd be aware there's some dodgy stuff still going on. Guest blogging for link building got a bit out of hand. And back in 2014, things changed. Matt Cutts, who I mentioned earlier from the Google Web Spam team, published a post on his blog that called for the end of guest blogging. He talks about how guest blogging has gone wrong and he tells us to stick a fork in it. So stick a fork in it. Guest blogging is done. It's just gotten too spammy. In general, I wouldn't recommend accepting a blog post unless you're willing to vouch for somebody personally or know them well. Likewise, I wouldn't recommend relying on guest posting guest blogging sites or guest blogging SEO as a link building strategy. So should we still look towards guest posting as part of our digital marketing strategy? And yeah, obviously my answer is yes. In his blog post, Matt is talking about poor quality link building. If you offer high quality, relevant posts to another website, you shouldn't fall foul of Google spam team. And later on, Matt updated his blog post to clarify that there's still value in guest posting. His issue was using it for easy search engine optimization links. Here's what he said. It seems like most people are getting in the spirit of what I was trying to say, but I'll add a bit more context. I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are still many good reasons to do some guest blogging exposure, branding, increased reach, community, etc. Guest blogging 
is a powerful digital marketing tool. So let's put Matt's comments aside for a moment. Guest blogging, when done well, is still a good way to build links to your website. And I'll talk about that in a little while. But it's also good for your reputation. I always like to puff out my chest and say, I've guest blogged on Social Media Examiner, John Loomer, Razor Social, Sage, Agora Pulse. And I feel when I say that, that it gives me a certain authority, a credibility. If I've written for those sites, I must be good, right? I even mention it in my LinkedIn profile. The thing is, Whenever I've written for one of those sites, I've rarely seen a massive amount of direct traffic as a result to my own website. But what I do see is an increase in Twitter followers, in Facebook likes, in mailing list subscribers. So even if I don't get SEO juice from those posts, I acquired a new audience who I can sell to in the future. The key is to have a plan to capitalize on your guest posts when they are published. When I do write for other sites and when I'm writing about something I've written about before on my own blog, I'll include a link back to the post on my site for further reading. As long as it's relevant, this should work well as an inbound link to my site. If you do do this, the key is not to just shoehorn any old link into your content. Only include it if it's relevant and Don't try to manipulate the anchor text. That's the text, you know, that's highlighted that when you click, it brings you through to your site. Just be natural and helpful with your content. You're listening to Blog Centric from Spiderworking. Right, so we know we should do it. How do you find sites that you can, that accept guest blog posts? Start with Google search. Come up with a keyword related to your blog posts. So for example, cats. And now search for that keyword or key phrase followed by guest post and put the guest post in inverted commas so that it only returns results that have that exact phrase in. And that should give you a whole load of search results related to the topic you want to blog about. And usually if it says guest post, it will mean that they accept guest blog posts. You can also get more creative with your searches. Replace the words guest post with post written by. And just be careful when you get those results to steer clear of anything that's marked as a sponsored post because that just means somebody has been paid to write that post. So it's like an ad on their site. And obviously, if you're paid to write, it's a no-follow link. So it's not good for your SEO juice. And well, maybe you do want to get paid, but that's not what guest blogging is about. I'd recommend you get the Moz bar, M-O-Z, M-O-Z bar installed on your browser because once you've done that, you can identify sites that you visit that have a higher domain authority than you. And like I said at the beginning, domain authority means that you're, you're more likely to rank high in search results. So you're looking for sites that have a higher domain authority than you. And that's a really good shortcut to finding sites that would be beneficial to write for. It's not always the case, but if you if you get an inbound link from a site with a higher DA, it should carry more Google juice than those with lower DAs. So get a pen and paper, get an Excel spreadsheet, whatever you happen to write on, and put down a list of the different sites that you want to write for. Once you have that list of sites, you need to start searching that site to see if they have a guest blogging or contributor guidelines. Any serious site that accepts blog posts should have that. If they don't, just get in in touch with the site owner or get in touch through the contact form to ask if there's a process or what the process is for applying to be a guest blogger. You should now have a short list of sites that you can approach for guest blogging and you know exactly how to do that make sure you follow their appro- their procedures when applying. Most sites will ask you for a content idea before accepting you and others will want to see samples of your work. Others might just want the whole article and then they'll make the decision. For example, many bloggers choose to write for the Huffington Post. If you want to blog there, first thing you need to do is complete a form on Google Docs pitching your big idea and I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. You'll be asked for your headline, 
your idea, your name, your bio, your email and a topic that your content will fit into. But before you submit an idea to the Huffington Post, have a look at the rest of the content on the site. Make sure whatever you're pitching matches the style and the tone of the existing posts. The good news is if they accept your post, you might be given a login for future submissions, which means it's much easier to write for them in future. So you've got your list, you're making your approaches. Somebody says, yes, how do you write that guest blog post? Well, one mistake I've made in the past was to inject too much of my own style into the guest post that I was writing. This can make the editor's job much harder. So instead of making a mistake I have, take a look at the site that you're writing for and look to see, do they have a specific format for writing? Like the writing frames that I talked about in last week's episode, episode 50. Do they have something along those lines? You might remember when I was outlining writing frames last week, I talked about Social Media Examiner and the frame that they seem to use on all of their posts. So have a look at the site and see if you can create a writing frame that would be consistent across their site. Because if you follow that, even if you haven't been asked to, you're going to win brownie points with the editors. Some sites will give you a specific style guide that they want you to conform to. So business site Tweak Your Biz, for example, has a detailed style guide that they ask you to follow. I'll put a link to that in the show notes can you see so you can see what's in there. And that makes your job as a blogger much easier. If the site you're writing for does produce a style guide, make sure you follow it to the letter. If you don't, you're making extra work for the editor. And you want to keep the editor happy because keeping the editor happy means they'll be happy to accept posts from you in the future. If they don't have a style guide, make notes on the posts on the site yourself. See if you can create your own little style guide. Again, because you mean that'll mean less work for the editor and more chance of your post getting accepted in future. Some sites will give you a deadline for your content once you've pitched it. Again, if you want to keep the editor on side, set yourself a target of finishing that post one day early. And that means they won't have to send up follow up emails to ensure you're on schedule and keep you on track. Again, making the editor happy. And before you submit a post to another site, always get a friend to proofread it. And the reason I say that is whenever I hit publish on a post on my own site, either I will notice a typo almost immediately or someone else will point one out to me. I can't go and change that when I'm guest blogging for other people. So I need to make sure or at least minimize the chance of any typo slipping through. So whenever I'm posting for a big site, I make sure I get someone to read it first. And they're not just looking for typos either. They'll tell me if I'm being a little bit verbose, which is a problem I have. You're listening to Blog Centric from Spiderworking. Now we talked about adding a link back to your website on the guest post. And most sites that accept blog posts or guest blog posts will let you do that. But be very careful Firstly, make sure it's 100% relevant. So if you're linking back to your own content from the guest blog post, is it 100% relevant to what you're writing about? If not, don't include it. When you include it, be careful with the anchor text. So it used to be good SEO practice to make the anchor text like really keyword friendly for the thing that you're linking to. But of course that got a bit spammy. People were hyperlinking all over the place with their keyword when it didn't really have any relevance. So, so don't just go for the keyword. You've got to remember as well that the sites that you're posting on have complete control. They can remove that inbound link as well. So don't get too upset if they do. That's their prerogative. It's their site. It's their editor. There is one place that they'll usually let you have a link and that would be in your bio section. 
and your bio section usually appears at the bottom or the top of the post saying who's writing this post and that's an opportunity for you to link back to your site. However, bio links are usually no follow, which means they don't have any Google juice, they're not going to affect your search engine rankings, but they're the way you can drive people into your website. Most people would link there to their homepage, but think about that. Is there another page on your website you could link to in your bio that would be more effective for you? So for example, could you link to your email sign up page or is there a particular blog post that you think will drive more customers in? So always think about that before you give people your bio. Again, of course, the editor has the right to change that link back to your homepage if that's what works for them. If you're ready to start guest blogging now, just be realistic with your posting schedule. We've talked about this before. It's very easy to get enthusiastic about stuff and then not have the time to deliver. So although there's a lot of value to guest blogging, make sure you don't end up abandoning your own blog because you're writing so much for other sites. Remember the real value in guest blogging is producing high quality posts and other sites that will not just give you that inbound link, but establish your expertise. So they have to be really good. And this means you're going to need to allocate a large slot of time for blogging. When I'm guest blogging for people, it takes me approximately two to three times longer than when I'm writing for my own site because I'm so worried about getting it wrong. Aim to write just one guest blog a month or even a quarter and make it an aim to make that a really good one. Once you've submitted and it's published, your job isn't over. This is just the beginning because now you need to maximise what you get from it. You need to promote it yourself. So just like you would your own post, share it out on your social media channels, set up a promotion schedule for all those channels to make sure it's getting out there. When you do share it on social media, make sure you tag the site that you're writing for. So they're aware that you're sharing their content as well, because that'll keep them happy. But beyond that, start looking for the people that are sharing your post online. You can do this really easily on Twitter. You just need to copy the link to the guest post and post it into the search bar on Twitter. And that'll bring up a full list of tweets of the people that are actually sharing that link. Now, this is a bit of work, but it's well worth it. Look at each user's profile that is sharing that link and find something conversation worthy there. So if you were to look at my Twitter bio, for example, you'd know I like cats, cakes and Doctor Who. So you could include that when thanking me for sharing my guest post on that blog. You could make a mention to Doctor Who or cats or, or cake. And believe me, I would notice you. I'd probably follow you as well. If you want to be really, really effective, you could actually alongside your thank you message, send an image, a personalized image saying thank you. So you could use something like Canva or PicMonkey to create a template and then just swap out the name of the person that you're thanking or maybe put in a picture as well. That would be really effective or even better, make a short little video saying thank you and upload it to Twitter or, or shoot it straight into Twitter. All of that will help you stand out and help you build a community from the people who are interested in the blog you're writing for and are sharing your posts. You're listening to Blog Centric from Spiderworking. Are you up for a bit of guest blogging then? If so, this week's blogging challenge is about guest blogging. Number one, make a list of sites you would like to guest blog on. Number two, find out what their submission process is. Number three, apply to those sites. Submit your suggestions to those sites. And number four, create a guest blogging schedule for yourself to make sure that you're not creating yourself too much work. And that's it for this week's episode of the Blog Centric Podcast. Can you believe? That next week is episode 
52. I have been podcasting for a whole year and I have a special episode coming up there. Before you go, I'd like you to do me a massive favour. I would like it if you could go over to iTunes or Stitcher and leave me a review. I'd like to say a five star review. If you think I'm worth five stars, give me five stars. I'd love that. Why? Well, you see, when people review on iTunes and Stitcher, that means that my podcast will shoot up the search results. So we get more listeners. It'll keep me podcasting and happy. And when I'm happy, that might make you happy too. You'll know you've done a good thing. So go over there now and do that if you can. I've left a video in the show notes that shows you how to review on iTunes. I have other videos on the way too. Until next week, happy blogging. Blog Centric from Spiderworking is sponsored by We Teach Social, social media e-learning courses for small business. Find out more at weteachsocial.com.